It's been more than three generations since a horse captured the heart and imagination of an entire country. Records were shattered. History was rewritten. A nation came together at a time that the presidential election and the war in Iraq were tearing it apart. A legacy was born. Smarty's story began in the tight-knit community of Chester County, Pennsylvania, just outside Philadelphia. Not a city typically known for thoroughbred racing. Historically, horse racing's only been around here since the 70s, but people have bred horses. Uh, there have been some great horses bred in Pennsylvania through the years. Jumping is big. In Chester County, it's gigantic horse racing. In Fox County, there's farms all over the place. So it is really big in the state, and it's spread a little bit to the center of the state out northeast of Harrisburg, where Grantville is, and Penn National. So it, it is big and historically big, but I think it had been sort of quiet because people weren't really paying attention to it. But that all began to change on February 28, 2001, when a small colt with a memorable name was born. Smarty got his name because he was born on my mother's birthday, February 28th. And I said to Chappie, I said, I'd really like to name this horse after my mother. We didn't think it would be fair to name him Mildred. Papa Jones tagged Smarty Jones onto the end of her name. And I said to Chappie, what do you think about calling him Smarty Jones? And he said, I like that. It kind of has a ring to it. Roy Chapman, known to his friends and colleagues simply as Chappie, initially made his mark in the automobile industry, owning and operating the Chapman Auto Group. Since childhood, Chappie always had a passion for horses and racing. I've always flew with horses all my life. <coughs> Not at this level, now let me get that straight. I came from a very blue collar family, and a very good family, but my grandfather, who rented horses out to pull ice wagons, you name it. That's how we got in the in horses. I met the Chapmans for the first time right before the Kentucky Derby. I mean, they were small time players, even though they had money. They never really spent a lot of money in the game uh, in comparison to some of the people who go to the sales and spend four or five hundred thousand millions of dollars. They were people who loved the racetrack, loved racing just to be at the track. And for them, certainly at the stage of their lives, to come up with this kind of horse was one in a billion shot. They never thought their love for horses would prove so fulfilling. In the early 1980s, Chappie and wife Pat entered the world of horse racing by founding Someday Farm. We played with names for months. We wrote down names and every day we were saying, someday we're gonna do this, someday we're gonna do that, someday we're gonna have the right horse. So one day we looked at each other and said, we ought to name this place Someday Farm. At the time Smarty was born, the Chapmans were enjoying notable success on the Eastern Steeplechase circuit, but their horses racing at Philadelphia Park had performed with only limited success. Steeplechase racing, and its cousin called timber racing or point-to-point -point racing, is where the sport touches ground and intermingles with normal people who love horses and the outdoor life, conducted at local venues like Woodland Rambles and Farmer's Pastures. The sport reflects a time when horses were used in hunting and war. The purses were small, the risks heavy. The track is often a trail through a forest with fixed log jumps. Contestants range from professional hunter jumpers to family horses ridden by weekend riders. Here in the rolling hills of southeastern Pennsylvania's Chester County is where the Chapman's Odyssey began. And atypically, they started with a winner. Uncle Merlin won the storied Maryland Hunt Cup trophy in 1989. Pat and Chappie thought they'd died and gone to heaven. The biggest mistake I guess we made was the first racehorse we ever bought. That's right. Won the first race he was ever in. And boy, we were hooked then. I mean, we thought 
This is so This easy. is easy. <laughs> Bob Kamak, a well-known trainer based at Delaware and Philadelphia Parks, was Smarty's godfather. It was Bob Kamak who arranged the union of Smarty's parents. Smarty originally came into everybody's picture because Bob Kamak picked his mother out of a sale as a yearling, and she turned out to be a good pick. And she was a very rewarding investment for the Chapmans herself. And I'm sure part of the reason he picked out Elusive Quality, who is Smarty's father, to breed to I'll Get Along uh, was because it added extra speed. I mean, Elusive Quality was a seriously fast horse. You breed a mare to a sire, and you hope. You don't know. You have no idea. You're guessing. And maybe you get a horse that can run, maybe you get a horse that can't run at all. But that was what Bob Kamak did in the Smarty Jones uh, story, and he was going to be Smarty Jones trainer. But at 8.20 a.m. on December 6, 2001, Bob Kamak and his wife Marianne were found on the back porch of the couple's Pedrick Town, New Jersey horse farm. Kamak had been shot once in the chest. His wife shot several times. His name is Wade Matthew Russell, 36 years old, the stepson of Bob Kamak. He had devastated my family. It was a horrendous murder. Both murders were horrendous. And for this fellow to take their lives like this, it affected so many people in the business, in the horse business, it affected so many friends. It is amazing. I had calls from California, from Florida, from Oklahoma, from Canada. I had calls from all over the United States and the world for condolences for Bobby. That's how much respect he had. And the, the crime uh, really affected the country, I mean this part of the country, and the horse racing business. Uh, Smarty, uh, when Smarty came along and, and Bobby's name came back out, the memories came back to me again, which were not good memories. But then after the, I started remembering the good times and the good things, and that worked out to my benefit. The Chapmans, I think they were already getting close to getting out of the game because Roy Chapman had emphysema. His wife, Pat, really, she had a great line. She said the only way to get, keep them away from the horses was to get rid of them. But once uh, K-Mac was murdered, that was it. They just said, we don't want to be in this anymore. Uh, this has really taken our joy away from they sold their beloved Someday Farm to a family that raises alpacas. They ended up, for reasons nobody can really explain, keeping two horses. Uh, one of them was very slow. They ended up uh, retiring the horse quickly because he's, he's never going to be capable of winning a race and he's a riding horse. The other one was Smarty Jones. Standing 15 three hands, five foot three inches at the top of the shoulder, Smarty is a relatively small horse. His legs aren't any longer or his musculature more developed than other horses he raced against. His father, Elusive Quality, had set a world record at one mile on turf at Belmont Park, but was an unproven sire at the time of Smarty's birth. His mother, I'll Get Along, was a sprinter of only modest accomplishments. So what made Smarty so special? He just had this raw, powerful speed where it almost, you didn't think it could possibly be harnessed. Seattle Slough was that, like that as a two-year-old. He was unbeaten, he just ran a hole in the wind. Smarty Jones, very similar. When we look at uh, Smarty's pedigree, uh, we can see some very interesting tie-ins to other Triple Crown winners. Because right in the sire side of his pedigree, you do find Secretariat fairly close up, Triple Crown winner. If you go down into the female side of his pedigree, you find Boldnesian, who was Seattle Slough's grandfather. So on both sides of the pedigree, you find sires' names that have been connected with Triple Crown winners. Another reason why this was no fluke of a pedigree, this was a very strong pedigree. In a way, Smarty Jones is a poster boy for a more scientific approach. And while his pedigree and his confirmation are certainly good and acceptable and not really a surprise for a good horse, neither are they really as predictable as the uh, extraordinary uh, variables he had for his gait and his heart and his way of going. Smarty Jones, for example, is 
kind of a poster boy for what we do because he didn't come out of the elite systems with the people, the billionaires and uh, all the ways they find and buy and breed horses and train them. He came out of Philadelphia Park with a, a competent journeyman trainer and a uh, local guy, but he wasn't a surprise to us. If you see Smarty in slow motion running, his legs don't leave the ground very far. They don't, most horses do. You can stop the frame at any point, any time, anywhere when he's running and it doesn't look like he's going to break his leg or fall on his nose. Whereas with most racehorses, they look awkward at different points in, when you try and take their stride apart in that kind of a fashion. When we ultrasound his heart, we find that the walls of the heart are very significantly thicker and that the heart is, holds more blood. And it's just a bigger, stronger, more efficient pump. And not by a little bit, by a lot. Sometimes as much as 50% more than the average horse. For centuries, bloodlines have been the blueprint for making a champion. Match a good sire and dam, and you might wind up with a horse that wins steady purses for three or four years, and then pulls down lucrative stud fees for another 15 years of active retirement. But does the plan work? Is there a better, more objective, more scientific way to measure the potential of a horse? For traditional bloodstock experts, a pedigree is a blueprint of the racing attributes of the immediate ancestors, sometimes going back four generations. This DNA roadmap helps in determining what will be a good match between Sire and Dan. When you look at a pedigree, you look at the racing aptitude of the ancestors. And the further you get back in the pedigree, the less important they become. So. I think it's risky to look too much beyond the first four generations, but you look at the aptitude of those progenitors and say, were they good racehorses? And if they were good racehorses, what in particular were they good at? Were they good at stamina? Were they good at speed? What could they do? But it gives you a real guide as to what's in the reservoir here if you look at the aptitudes of those ancestors. So that's really what a pedigree is, is a written examination of the attributes, aptitudes of the ancestors. An alternative to this method are the sports medicine profilers, who say the probabilities of racing success can best be gleaned from examining a horse as a baby and using scientific studies on the gait and heart scans to determine its potential. Either way, sports medicine profiling or pedigree, Smarty looked like a good bet for success. He had enough of a profile in traditional bloodlines and displayed the right stuff in person to be far from a long shot at the big time. Was he helped or hindered by his birthplace? There's not a tradition, not a huge tradition of horse racing. It only goes back 30 years. And there aren't enough dollars bet, pure and simple. The money bet determines how big the purses are unless they're supplemented by something such as slot machines, which of course is going to change the entire picture in Pennsylvania racing. Well, the thing that was particularly unusual about uh, this horse is because he is a Pennsylvania bred. And, you know, it's a small number of horses, thoroughbreds, that are born in Pennsylvania. But let me mention that there are some other great horses that have also come from Pennsylvania. Some other, Danzig, was a great sire uh, and, a, and a talented racehorse that came from Pennsylvania. Stormcat, leading sire in the world, was born here. Leafard, another very strong sire, was Pennsylvania bred. So believe me, in Pennsylvania, we can raise a good horse. But for the most part of the past century, Pennsylvania was predominantly known for trotters and pacers, horses that raced with carts or sulkies attached and covered ground in differently measured gates instead of the full gallop used by the thoroughbreds. Although the purses are smaller, the history and tradition of standard bread racing is as long and deep and the competition as fierce as in thoroughbred racing. In fact, Pennsylvania does have a 2004 Triple Crown champion. By winning the Kentucky Futurity, the Yonkers Trot, and the Hambletonian, Smarty Jones' direct contemporary, the great Wind Song's legacy, bred and foaled in Pennsylvania by Dr. Paul Spears, became the first winner of Trotting's three most prestigious races in over 30 years. Clearly, there must be something in the water. 
Although there are 90 thoroughbred race tracks and 29 standard bred race tracks in 33 states across America, Smarty's native state of Pennsylvania has only two thoroughbred race tracks, Penn National near Harrisburg and Philadelphia Park, plus two standard bred race tracks for trotters and pacers, the Meadows near Pittsburgh and Pocono Downs. For a champion racehorse to emerge from Pennsylvania in the year 2004, was a definite long shot. This brings us to the cold but otherwise featureless morning of February 28, 2001, when Pennsylvania's checkered past and long sleeping potential was about to be awakened by the birth of a small colt in a barn at Someday Farm. I took care of him um, and his mom uh, the whole time he was there. There were no signs, you know, at all in the beginning of him being anything you know, other than just an ordinary uh, little colt. Smarty was sent to Florida to be broken for racing and returned to Philadelphia to the barn of John Service, a native of Charlestown, West Virginia, who had scored his first win as a trainer in 1984. Smarty could run, but he was a common looking thing. I mean, he was skinny, he was little, he had no neck on him. And John looked at him and he said, is that the horse that they said was so good? <laughs> And Bill said, that's the one. Huh. Well, John saw him work out the first time. He said, boy, that horse can't run. On July 27, 2003, Smarty stepped into the starting gate for a training session. It almost became his grave. And John called me 7 o'clock in the morning and said, Mr. Chapman, one of your horses got hurt. I said, well, you don't have to tell me which one. I know which one, but the, old, the slow ones never get hurt. <laughs> he was standing fine, and he was closed up in the gate, and for no reason at all, he, he just went straight up and actually tried to jump out over the, the front doors and hit his head on the iron bar going across the top. He said, Smarty reared up in the, in the starting gate and hit his head, and he said, it was so severe, we really thought he was dead. Smarty was shipped to the New Jersey Equine Center, where he was diagnosed with a broken orbital bone and multiple hairline fractures. He spent three weeks in the hospital. The accident nearly caused him to lose his left eye. When he came in the door, I really expected a horse that was debilitated, you know, very scared, and certainly a mess. And he trotted in the door, dragging the handler, which I thought was very fitting, seeing as what he's done now. But his head looked horrible, it was very swollen. Um, the left eye was swollen shut and bleeding, but he had an amazing spirit. He just really seemed unaffected, his ears up, head up, whinnying like, hello, here I am, what's going on? After months of care, he finally made it back to Philadelphia Park on November 9th, winning by seven and three quarters lengths in his debut. In his second start, just two weeks later, he romped by 15 lengths. John said, uh, we've got to start talking about a plan for this horse. He said, well, the first thing we have to find out is if he can do two turns. I said to John, what are we going to do with this horse? I want to go to Derby. And he said, we're going to Arkansas, and we're going to get to the Derby by the back door. I thought that was the best route to take because he was very immature. You know, he'd only run twice going into his three-year-old year. So, you know, he would have an opportunity to mature at his own pace. So that, that's, that's why we went to Arkansas, and that was the beginning of the Derby Trail for us. While the Chapman spent their winters in Florida, Service spent time in Arkansas, which is where he took Smarty. They are such horse fans out there. Nice track, nice facility, and the uh, night before Smarty's race, John said, we're going to go to Arkansas. We're going to race in the Southwest Stakes in February, the Rebel in March, and hopefully the Arkansas Derby in April. And they're off! For the 100th year of racing in Arkansas, a $5 million prize had been established for a horse who won the Rebel Stakes, Arkansas Derby, and Kentucky Derby. Smarty's jockey was Stuart Elliott, who had won over 3,300 races but few outside Philadelphia had heard of him. That was about to change for this journeyman rider. I said to John, uh, are you sure this guy can handle the Derby with 20 horses in there? He's never been to the Derby before, never even ran on that track before. Do you think he can do it? 
And he said, he can do it. Don't worry about it. And I said, well, fine. Now we're going to stick this to it. Smarty Jones leading by two. It is Smarty Jones. One step more to Kentucky and one giant step to $5 million. Smarty Jones has won the Arkansas Derby. He's still undefeated. Six wins in a row. When we made the plans to go to Arkansas, we had no idea about the bonus. It didn't come into to play at all because really it was unimaginable. I mean, you really you think of a horse winning all three of those races, and it's almost impossible. And you think, how, how would a horse ever do that? Smarty won both these races and set his sights dead center on the Triple Crown. First stop, the Kentucky Derby. The three races were uh, go way back to the uh, the turn of the century, but it was a there was a reporter that uh, put the idea together that you combine the, the Derby, the Preakness, and the Belmont and call it the Triple Crown, and uh, the newspapers loved it. And so and it became a, an instant success and, a, and, a, and something that everybody would strive for. It's the premier test of a young horse to be able to run a, a short distances and up to a mile and a half is the supreme test because you have to do it on three specific Saturdays. You can't have any illnesses, you can't have any unsoundnesses. Uh, you just don't make it if you don't show up. Smarty had never faced this level of competition before, and the professional handicapper's morning line made him a relative long shot. But the public so loved him, they bet him down to the favorite. Little old ladies and everyday working people who had never bet before found their way to an OTB to bet $2. On May 1, 2004, the Pennsylvania-bred Smarty Jones went to gate as the 4-1 to one favorite. The 130th Kentucky Derby was contested over a drenched track under gloomy skies. One of the hardest rains I've ever seen in my life. The track was an absolute bog, which took weeks of work and made it into a mystery. Over 140,000 braved the storm. None of the trainers knew how their horses were going to react when they got out onto the track. The question was, would he like the going? Would he handle the off track? You know, we just had to go out there and hope for the best. They're off in the Kentucky Derby. When the gate opened, jockey Mike Smith sent five to one second choice Lionheart straight to the front and toward the rail for a ground saving trip around the two turns of Churchill Downs. A tightly bunched pack settled in behind him with Smarty Jones in the middle. Lionheart led the field around the clubhouse turn and down the backstretch. Smarty Jones was in between four horses, and Elliot had a choice. Does he stay there and get potentially squeezed back and maybe eliminated, or does he just jam his way through there and let the horse do the rest? After six furlongs, jockey Stuart Elliott asked Smarty Jones for more speed. I was directly behind Lionheart, and I was able to ease Smarty Jones off of the rail. Now he's, you know, he's free of the mud and he's in a good close stalking position where he was used to being. And then from that point, I knew that he was going to be very tough in the race. He drew even with Lionheart at the quarter pole after a mile in 137.35, and the pair dueled for most of the stretch. With a furlong to go, Elliot went to the whip, and Smarty Jones responded. Smarty Jones! 